Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to today's show. Uh, before we get to our guests, just a thank you very much for all your feedback and comments. And if you're watching this, please hit subscribe. But straight on to our guests that Kieran and I have got today, a player that played for Middlesbrough, Celtic and Ipswich, and then went on to have a successful managerial career, including in the English and Scottish Premiership. A very warm welcome to Tony Mogger Mowbray. Hi, how are you doing? All? Good, Good stuff. You. How yeah. you doing, Jaffa? Great, KD. Thank you very much. Looking hey, well, the, mate. All the, uh, all the managers I've played under, I just, as a respect thing, I always call them Gaffer. I don't know. It's always <laughs> them. Still called George Gaffer. Still called yeah. everyone Gaffer. Just a respect thing. That's good, mate. It just shows you your, uh, your values and your human compass. It's good, mate. You, uh, you're a respectful guy. It's good. Yeah. Good man. So, uh, what we do here, Mogra, is we just kind of go through your Ipswich career and I'll, I'll nudge you through the, the seasons and, and KD will hopefully chip in with a couple of funny stories. But before <laughs> we get to when you joined us in October 1995, quite a few yeah. fans are interested in your views on a game that happened in April 1988 at Portman Road. It was Ipswich 4, Middlesbrough 0 and Daly Naxxonson scored one of the most explosive hat-tricks that I, I've certainly seen. What do you remember about that? Oh, I remember it really well, to be honest, because, you know, me and Pally had sort of developed a, a relationship that was got a few people talking, really. We'd had an amazing 86, 87, 87, 88. The club was on the rise from being, you know, the gates were padlocked and everything at Ayrson Park. And we built a bit of a reputation and the team were doing well. And... Um, We'd heard of Daly and Atkinson. I'd seen some of his stuff, to be honest, and how know, he could belt the ball and yet, and how powerful he was. And yet we went there expecting to perform well. And yet this kid, I, I, he, <laughs> he was so strong, so powerful, and he could lash it from anywhere, really. And um, yeah, listen, I, I remember, I, I sit with Gary Palace every Wednesday in the Armai Street and have a coffee with him in a, in a, in a coffee shop called The Mockingbird. And um, and yeah, I'll remind him next week about uh, Daly and Atkinson's hat trick. He'll probably blame me for most of them, but um, yeah, it's some, some days it was like that. And, and I think we put it behind us very, very quickly and just put it down as one of those things. You know, we were we were generally on the, you know, we I think at the end of that season, we um, we went off with England and, and Bobby Robson, so Bobby Robson, the great Bobby Robson, took an England B team on a on a tour and um, you know we were doing all right we were we were up there doing well and uh, and Daly and Atkinson smashed that trick I remember one of the goals from 30 yards and Rocket nearly took the took the net off the back of the goal you know it was um, yeah apart from that I just you know I remember Polly and me talking afterwards just saying listen let's put it behind us really quick and move on at, at that time there was a lot of good players we play against Wright and Bright and people like this you know and it was um, and we always were up for it Sheringham and Cascarino they were they were big Big battles. There was uh, there was good competition. Every team had big centre forwards, and, and it was a um, yeah. It, it knocked our ego a little bit. Probably it took it probably put our feet back on the ground. Daily in Atkinson's actually. Gaffer, you touched on um, the England B. Yeah, um, Bobby Robson, and not many fans know you. I think you had three appearances for England B, all in that one yeah. season. I did, and yeah. it was a young Paul Gascoigne in that oh, England honestly. B squad. How was he then as well, just before we get to the Ipswich thing? Because yeah. obviously Gaz is like a national treasure. Could yeah. you tell he was top, top, even at such a young age in the B squad? I'd, I'd been talking to somebody recently, Kieran, who talked, probably, probably the, the player who I'm, you know, most, not proud of, but that I've been on the pitch with, shared the pitch with, he's, he's the most amazing footballer. I mean... The, uh, uh, what a personality, what a human being. I mean, I remember Iceland away, it was sleeting, it was snowing, it was freezing, right? We're doing the warm-up, there's a band on the pitch, there's a beauty competition going on and Gaz is chipping balls into the trombone from 50 yards <laughs> and uh, and we're all just watching him and he's got like, he's not doing passing drills or working the goalie, he's chipping the ball into the band where he's trying to get it in the trombone. <laughs> and um, and on that day, right, he scored the best goal I think I've ever seen. He dribbled from the edge of his own box round every single play, as he did. He used to like push it out with his arms, didn't yeah, he? His so arms were his biggest yeah. attribute. And, and uh, he dribbled on their old team, round the goalie and stuck it in the net. And it was just an honour to be with him, really. He, he was, you know, he had his 
things that he, he didn't eat with the team because he couldn't trust himself to eat the right food and stuff like that. I think, you know what I mean? He'd have, a, he'd have in, in his room and, um, but a, a brilliant guy, a brilliant human being. And, um, you know, for me, an honour to be on the football pitch with such an iconic footballer, really. Um, Paul Gascoigne, wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On the 6th of October, 1995, it was announced that Ipswich Town had signed you for £300,000 from, from Celtic. Um, interested in how Ipswich came on your, your radar in, in what obviously was a, a very difficult time when your, your first yeah. wife had, had passed away uh, you know, on New Year's Day yeah. that year. Yeah. Well, listen, I'd have to say if it wasn't really in my mind to move. George, it's a lesson I learned not to do, really. George pestered me and <laughs> pestered me and to the point I'd see my phone ringing, I'd think, God, not again. And I'd ignore it. And um, But he never give in and he kept phoning. And I don't know why he was so wanted to sign me so much. I'm not sure. But um, I wasn't ready to leave, I didn't feel. You know, I'd lost my wife. It was nine, ten months ago. I'd spent a long time almost not being a footballer, but being a... Um, a charity guy who was doing events and, and selling supporters were putting on dinners and I would turn up and try and do a speech without crying and um, it was a very emotional time in my life and George was very very persistent and, and one day probably in a week and day I agreed to, to fly down and meet him and um, and he showed me around and Listen, I had to make a decision. I had to get on with my life, really. I was a footballer, but I'd become like a charity worker for breast cancer. And um, and, and so I made the choice. And, and it, it made sense to get as far away from the northwest of you know Scotland um, to come right down to the southeast. And so I could, you know, all the influences would have gone. I could try and just focus on my football. So I came there just by myself in a bag and... Um, got on with just the football but it was it, it's not easy you know but um yeah and I, I had probably started on my memories I had a tough start I remember coming away from the game one day and the phone the phone in was on and some guy saying it'll be a it'll be I don't know what did he say it'll be a cold day in hell if I ever think Tony Mowbray is a good player what on earth are we doing signing him and I you know them sort of things they they resonate a little bit the fact here we are all these years later I I remember those comments you know, I hope somewhere on the line I had a decent time at Ipswich and, and helped the team, you know, develop. And, and ultimately, George was proven right that it was a, a decent sign in, in the long term. But I, could, I can well understand early on, I probably looked like a washed up footballer, really, and was struggling. And, uh, and that was probably more mental. Than, because I, I do feel, that, and I've said a lot in the, in, in, uh, over recent years, I think I played my best football in my middle 30s because, not because I was anything other than I understood the game. I knew how high the line should be. I knew where to play. I knew when to flick things back to my goalie. I knew when to block people. I knew the dark arts of football in my 30s and it's uh, and which benefited from that, I think. I always say that about you, Gaffer. Obviously, when I broke into the team later on when we get, I obviously yeah. played the half a season at right back. Yeah. And you weren't letting me go nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> you come and stand yeah. right here where that ball's there because yeah. you just, you got people in position. You knew where the yeah. line was, and yeah. that was, uh, I always yeah. say that's one of John Terry's big strengths. He, he, yes, he just gets people exactly in the right positions, and you never see John Terry yeah. get exposed. And no, that's what, no. I, and that's the way I tried to play. And I think you, um, yeah. I remember the right back at Middlesbrough for ten years. Before. I don't. I hope I didn't know his career back because it was the same really early on. You have to know your strengths and weaknesses, and I and I genuinely felt not selfishly because it was about me. It was about trying to win and keeping clean sheets. And uh, and if I felt by being exposed in wide areas, for lack of mobility, I needed to keep the protection on that side. So I didn't need to do that, but I could head the ball out. I could I could protect the screen in front and, and uh, tell people left shoulder, right shoulder, cut the passing lines off. And um, yeah, and, and ultimately we did okay. I think when you first came along, I think part of it was it appeared that George Burley seemed to struggle to find you a, a centre half uh, partnership. You you were with yeah. David Linnigan, John Walk, Steve Sedgley, Tony yeah. Vaughan, Clay Thompson as well. Um, yeah. how, how, how difficult was that for you at, at at that time coming into the into the club and and trying to you know show show what yeah. you could do? Yeah, listen, all them lads you mentioned out there, I've got good fond memories of them all and good. Good lads and um, 
Yeah, I, I think what it, it combinations really central back centre backs. You know, ultimately we went to a back three and it worked a treat. Um, but you know, as, as George was probably searching for the right answers, really the right the right combination, whether it was mobility around me or you know or um, a bit more experience that I would, would that the, the combination had to be right. Really, generally I would have wanted speed. That's probably why Klaus came. Eventually, and played alongside me for a little bit. You know, Thompson, Klaus Thompson could run and was, was fast and mobile. And uh, and my qualities were more vocal and, and putting people in the right positions and getting the line right and um, keeping the, no distances between the lines so teams couldn't really hurt us by playing through us. But um, it was about a combination. And ultimately, we, we we found that in a back three. That, and if I was thinking about picking an Ipswich team, it would probably be me in the middle of Venus off the left and Madrid off the right. And um, and that the balance felt well with you know with Magilton sort of sitting in front with two ball distributors either side of me. Bino's left foot was was fantastic, and John McGreal could step out with his right foot and pick passes into midfield, and it just balanced really. I think the team. Uh, November nineteen ninety five. The, the question I'm sure that you get asked a lot is obviously you played in the in the old firm derby, but that was the first time that you had the the East Anglian derby. We we lost 2-1 away at Carrow Road in controversial circumstances with the, the referee awarding a, a, a late penalty for us and the linesman flagged out, flagged that off. So how, how does the Ipswich Norwich derby compare to the um, the old firm derby? I'm sorry, I've got a bat in it. You cannot compare the two derbies. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I was asking it, I thought. And, uh, Ipswich Norwich means a lot to me. We cannot be comparing the Ipswich Norwich derby to the Glasgow derby, but I'll let Mogger speak. But that's yeah. just my take on that. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, I think any derby in any in any area across the country. I know I've just left Blackburn, and did I didn't even know Blackburn and Burnley were so massive until I got there. And yet, you know, any local area, um, there's they seem you know hatred's a strong word. You know, it, it's football competition, the rivalry. It's it, it, it is it's big. So. Ipswich and Norwich, you know, they're an hour or so away. It's um, and yet there is there's, there's genuine dislike of each colour's colour, colour, and even some of the players. I remember, you know, I know Kieran's good mates with young Bellamy, isn't he? He would have played against us at times. You know what I mean? And and noised a few of us up with his vocals during the game. But um, yeah, I think the, I think the Glasgow derby is like it's more than a football match. I mean, the noise, the colour, depending where that game is at, it's like. Wow, well, it's not it, you know you have to have some personality to be involved and in, and in, in try and thrive in that environment. It's um, it's really difficult to describe an old firm derby because the build up of it is the, the games before it don't mean anything. So you have to win anyway. You've got to win every game when you manage Celtic or play for Celtic or Rangers. And um, and when that game comes along, it's about survival really. As a footballer on the pitch, you you have to survive. You you. You know the, the old adage of football defenders playing with fear that not not to be the guy who costs the goal that comes tenfold in that game. Don't be the guy who loses your man and costs the game in an old field derby. You know it's uh, you you probably won't survive it really. It's um, there's a lot of not fear but huge tension in that football match that goes well beyond just football. There's obviously all the religious aspects and, and, and you know hundreds of years of, of depth in a football game really and um, you want to as a football you want to play in the biggest games you know Kieran played on the biggest platforms in, in the Premier League and for his country and you want to be involved in the big games and yet that game there's a, there's probably too much hatred is, you know that, as I said that's a strong word but it's very very raw in that environment to be honest it's um, it's uncomfortable if it's not your personality yeah, no, I definitely wasn't comparing it. I thought you might have said that the East Anglian derby is about 10% of the, of the old firm no, derby. Listen, as I said, every derby is very, very important to the, to the people in the area. And so, you know, I, I was involved in, in Ipswich and Norwich derbies and they, they were huge events and you wanted to win for your supporters and for the people in the community that it meant so much to. Because football ultimately is about the people, the people who come and support you and wear their scarves and have their flags and wear the shirts and you want to make them proud if you can. December 1995, you scored your first goal for town. It was away at Wolves. It was a late 90th minute header uh, to equalise. Um, Fred Barber 
what, it was his only game about it. He, he wore a mask. I just wonder what your view was when he <laughs> went running down the tunnel wearing the mask on, have with the mask. I think I remember the game. I think I remember the goal. It was a bit scrappy, wasn't it? I wasn't even definitely. It was. I don't think it was a bullet header. Uh, you know, it was. It was a bit scrappy. It bounced. It ricocheted. It was in. And um, yeah, so that, I think. Yeah, I think. What year was that in? Did you say ninety? Ninety-five, December ninety-five. Ninety-five. You know, I think that team was still developing. George was searching for a team. I think uh, for a while, and then he, he, everything fell into place. And um, and and. Yeah, I don't remember too much of, the, of that game. It's nice Vino to score Martin, a goal. Yeah. But it was who? Vino, Vino Martin. Martin. He might have yeah. been, to be honest, mate. He might have been that day. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I remember it was a, them sort of day. Bully might have been playing, you know, bullying much. I, I'm not sure, but, um, yeah. Listen, uh, Wolves, it's amazing football, isn't it? You know, look at Wolves now, you know, big Premier League club and uh, foreign managers, foreign investment. It's... Um, it's amazing the cycle of football, how clubs, you know, Ipswich Town being, being you know, almost, it, sadly, it has to get back. It has to, you know, it shouldn't be where it is. And uh, it's amazing, you know, so football people from afar, you know, me at Blackburn in the last few years, looking at the crowds at Ipswich, you're getting 20 or thousand, you know, in, in League One. It's, um, it just shows how much it means to the people and to the, to the football club. And, um, and I, I'm sure they'll be back. And, you know, and who's to say whether it takes... Two years, one year, five years, ten years, but they'll be back in the Premier League at some stage on the cycle, really. And um, you know, let's hope it's sooner rather than later. You, you mentioned Steve Bull. I've got a probably a bit bigger striker and goal scorer in Alan Shearer, who oh. famously said there are there are no easy games in the Premiership um, apart from Ipswich at home, and we. <laughs> We got we got drawn against them in the third round of the the FA Cup. Obviously, we drew nil nil at Portman Road, and then we went to Ewood Park and and won one nil there. I just if you have what memories you have of the, those two games? She just scored a goal that was rolled out for offside, climbing all over my back. To be honest, that um, not a, not a lot. I, I know as, as another Ipswich uh, Ipswich game I, I scored because obviously being the manager of Blackburn over so five and a bit years. People always talk about it. We in an orange kit. I volleyed one in the top stanch against mm -hmm. them in the two-two draw. I think, but um, no, and they were pretty rare. Me volleying them in the top stanch, but uh, um, yeah, she really listen. I, these when you look back, the, these iconic players, of course. But um, I don't know. They were just another centre forward to me. You know, ultimately, as you say. Very early in my career, in the early eighties, it was a playing against the Sheringhams and, and people like that. It's um, and, and playing alongside Gascon. Different routes, different things. You, you you know different decisions footballers make in their lives. I'm sure Kieran's got a few stories. He maybe could have made this move when he went down this move, and and you know you, you've got to be happy with your career. And um, it's it's great if Switch could you know play Blackburn Rovers and, uh, and and get a result like that away from home. So. Um, because Blackburn Rovers in the, in the middle 90s were a massive, huge club. As everybody reminds you, when you're there at that club, they obviously won the Premier League in 94, 95. And um, yeah, they're on a journey, of course, on the way back from League One over, the, over you know, three or four years ago. And um, and, and like Ipswich, surely they, you know, they'll, they will bounce back and, and um, as if she shall bounce back and become strong. And hopefully in the years to come, they're playing each other in the Premier League. That was the game when we beat them away when it was basically the game where Richard Wright really broke through. Yeah. Did you know Richard was destined from the top from the minute you came into the club? I think he was he was in and around it when I I'm not sure you know around the, when I first came. I'm, I'm sure Wright he would have been in and around the team and yeah. Um, but yeah, I liked I liked Richard Wright. He was almost a um, a modern day goalie before before Goal. He, he wasn't he wasn't brilliant with his coming out with the ball like modern day goalies after, but he had a wonderful left foot. He could ping it, you know, he could, you know, he could drill balls out to fullbacks and hit wingers and stuff like that. And um yeah, Richard was a young guy. I was an experienced centre half, you know. I mean, I, I felt as if I could almost dominate the goalkeepers to, you know, get higher or whatever whatever it might be. And um I generally liked the, the people around, you know, Darren Bent was 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 around wasn't he you were a young lad coming through it was like uh, you could right. feel the talent young Ambrose you could feel the talent of the football club and that was Chloe and Sarge in my mind I'd got there and seen this these these wonderful coaches working with these 
really talented young boys I knew the future was going to be bright could see it it's just whether I was going to run out of time of, of influencing them and playing them with them Kieran really in my mind you catapulted really I don't know you'd have to you'd know your own career better than me but it seems as if you you didn't play any reserve football eh? you jumped straight from youth team straight into the first team and you were off and flying and we, you were the best player within a few games really and um I always remember Brian Alton when you've not long had broken it, talking to George about, you know, it was it was either going to be um, George Williams coming out of the team or me coming out of the team to fit because of your legs and your ability to link the back to the front. Um, and, and ultimately, George came out, the, George Williams came out of the team and I sort of cemented this defensive block, but you you managed to break lines and, and you know, help us win football matches, Kieran, really, you know, for such a young lad, it was amazing. And and ultimately, you were always going to move to the highest level and uh, play for a big club. But, um, but yeah, if, uh, football is, is great. I knew what, maybe from the age of 22 at Middlesbrough when Bruce Rioch arrived at Middlesbrough that I was going to be a football manager because all I ever thought about was the positional side of the game, the movements to get space on the pitch, Um how a team should operate and function, depending whether you've got slow centre ass or fast centre ass. So I look at modern day now, the top top teams all have mobile centre ass who play high up the pitch, and the team presses, and they have to be able to recover. And the goalie plays twenty yards out of his box. It's just condensing the space on the pitch. Yeah, the greatest you kind know, of Guardiola or Klopp, whichever camp you're in, do it differently. But but. Um, you know, one's total ball possession and condenses the pitch because they've got the ball in the opposition half all the time. And the other one sometimes gives the ball, gets the ball into the other team by hitting long passes and then pushing the whole team up. And if the other team try and play out, they, they keep taking it off them around their box. It's, um, you know, it's wonderful to see modern day football, I think. And through the 90s, it was evolving and it took probably Guardiola's Barcelona to, to like a generational coach really to change young coaches' perceptions of how football was played. And then Klopp came along, you know, six, seven, eight years ago and, and massively, it was OK not to be the team in total possession of the ball like Barca's tic-a-tacker. You could actually give the ball away but then press them really hard. And um, I think modern-day football is, is a joy to watch, really. And um, them top teams, everybody's striving. Somewhere along the line, there'll be a, another generational coach that'll find a way of playing football that that upsets a Guardiola or a Klopp style of play and everybody will think, wow, that's, <laughs> that's how we're going to play. Yeah. It, might be Kieran, it might be Kieran Dyer, who knows? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah, it might be. <laughs> no, listen, I think that's what makes the great coaches in the world. They mm. do something different. Sir Alf Ramsey in 1966 didn't play with wingers and they won the World Cup. Every team played the same way and all of a sudden he changed something and England won and he was like a guru and and who else? Johan Cruyff, who was really the inspiration of Guardiola, changed football to total possession, and um, and then obviously Guardiola took it on in in, in the you know two thousand and eight, two thousand and ten, them sort of years, and um, we all watched it on a Sunday night in La Liga on Sky Sports, and just thought, wow, what a team! But I do think Liverpool have come along and and, and Klopp showed how you can play out of possession at times and just be as effective. And Simeone does it, of course, with Atletico. And um, there's no right way or wrong way to play football. But, you know, right at the top end, you have to try and win, of course. Of course yeah. the, the next 18 months of your career, with it, which were largely plagued with a, with a groin injury and you were out for periods of 22, 17, 13 games and stuff. During yeah. that time... Uh, I was going to call him the young man, but uh, KD obviously made his, his debut in that time. And at the start yeah. of 97, 98, Matt Holland and, and, and Mark Venus joined. How, yeah. how, how was that 18 months for you? Because it seemed that you were often yeah. on, on, on the cusp of getting back, but, but not quite getting into the team again. Yeah, I think probably age and, and wear and tear was catching up, really. I, I played probably, hardly missed a game in 10 years at Middlesbrough. I felt as if I played, you know, 50, 60 games a season for a long, long time. And um, and then I missed a lot of football through that, that period towards the end of my time at Celtic. And, um, and maybe just wear and tear caught up with me. And, and it was a real frustration, my pelvic area. I had, I had the one time I had an injury at Middlesbrough in my early careers, it was a pelvic injury as well. And so groins became a, a burden for me. I, 
you have a um, I had an operation in Ipswich anyway where they just severed the, the tendon, the main tendon. And so rather than it irritating all the time, it just wasn't there. And you just have to build up your muscles around it to keep it strong. It's frustrating, uh, you know, especially as you're getting older, you want to you want to keep playing. You want to um, play as many games as you can. And I had a frustrating time a little bit at, at, through injury there. But, you know, ultimately, I don't look back on my Ipswich career and think about injuries and not playing. I think of the good times and the good players and, and the good teams and ultimately how my football career, you know, eventually finished was a real highlight, really. I felt my debut was away at Newcastle against Kevin Keegan and Mickey Shannon up front and my last ever game was at Wembley Stadium where I helped the team get to the Premier League and scored a goal. And, and you know, everything in between, the good, the bad, the ugly, I look back and think, well, I give everything I've got and I worked hard. And and I wasn't the greatest footballer. I was never of the talent of Kieran Dyer, but um, but I worked hard and give everything I had. And, and 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 I don't look back and think I let anybody down at any stage. You know, people would either like my type of footballer or not. I was all in really with the teams I played for. I didn't play for ten teams. You know, I played for three teams in my, in my football career and um, they all mean a lot to me. And, um, yeah, I've managed two of them. Um, I managed Ipswich on a part-time thing for four games. But, um, who knows what the future brings somewhere down the line. It cycles and maybe the circle might join one day. But also, what people don't understand in the fans is, is that even though you were injured, like you said, through that spell of your career... You were like George's member of staff. You were invaluable to the advice you gave to the likes of me, Richard Wright. You could you could have a conversation with David Johnson. Then the next minute, I'll see you having a conversation with Bobby Petter. You could yeah. fit with any clique and give us yeah. the nuggets of advice about future, just about mm -hmm. family. Like it's a shame I didn't take. It's a shame I didn't take all the advice you gave. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I would have done after mistakes I did later on in life, but I just. I just feel that even though you weren't on the pitch, you were still very valuable to the football club with what you were doing behind the scenes for for all the players. Well, thank you, Kieran. That's 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 kind. But um, I feel that's you. You are you're a product of where you're brought up. I was brought up in a steel town, really. My dad was a scaffolder in, in, in a steelworks, and and I felt I was being given good values in life, and and had a the. Um, I, I still try and live by a set of values today, really. And once you're part of a team, you're a part of a team. And if I couldn't be out there heading it and kicking it for you and with you, I could. I always wanted to be around the team. George knew that. George is a good man. George is still a good man. He's, uh, you know, he's um, and he had a fabulous managerial career and did amazing things at, at, at Ipswich Town. But um, and he allowed me to to stay close to the to the group, really, which was was good. And um, as I said. I like footballers, just why I, I manage. I like footballers. They're generally good, good guys. They're competitive animals. They, you know, I remember God, Simon Milton. I know he's still around. I got to, I got to Ipswich one day and we played five side. He was kicking lumps out of everybody, right? And it's, I just thought, what? he had his big studs on, he's making slide tackles, he's crunching people. And it was because he wanted to play, he wanted to be in that team. He was, and I think, Listen, it was a really competitive edge, and it was for a lot of years. I was there nine years, I think, it Ipswich, and uh, from start to finish. And um, I, I enjoyed every minute of it. Lots of great people, great characters, Ian Marshall, and people like that. You know what I mean? They're no. old school, but really, really good people. We, we, you're talking about Milts kicking people. We had Mauricio yeah. Carrico on, and oh, he would do yeah. anything to win in training. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I was really close with Mauricio and his yeah, family, and I'd. Um, and you know, I love is a strong word, but I love I love Murray Shaw. He was a because he had good values. You know, he was a he, he had an Argentinian way about him when he always nipping people anything to win. But his core values were top notch. Mm -hmm. He knew what was right and he knew what was wrong. And I really liked Murray Shaw Tariqo. And um, well, and what a career he had as well. You know, you, you could feel the talent on the pitch. Yeah, you could feel the quality he had, and he went on to play for Tottenham and obviously did very, very well. And he, he was being Gus Poyet a long time, of course, and uh, in his managerial career. So, um, yeah, but a, a diamond of a human being, but show. Because you were, you were. I've always wanted to ask you this because you were club captain, and then we obviously signed Matt Holland. Yeah, because Matt Holland was the future. George made the decision to make Matt 
captain? Did he have a conversation with you? Uh, I, can't, I can't remember, Kate, to be honest. It, it never, uh, it, it doesn't, it's not, I think probably through the through my injuries, the yeah. opportunity came. I guess that I have this as a manager sometimes, you know, uh, Lenahan was always captain, he's gone to the butter, actually, Lenahan was captain, but when the days that they're injured, the days they get suspended, the kit man comes to you and says, Gaffer, Gaffer, who's captain today? And I think, Poor, I haven't even thought, um, let's give it to Travis, you know what I mean? It's a, yeah. Somehow, sometimes like that, and yet Matty is captain material. Eh? You'd have to say that. And so if I was out of the team and the team are functioning and Matty's of an age and I'm kind of coming towards the end, I think it's just good management. Keep going. You know, it's, it's, sometimes I think that, you know, that playoff final, let's have a game. Oh, Matt, I was captain. I wasn't captain, right? Because I, I, I generally, wherever I've been, I've been captain. Mm. And yet, um, Listen, it's it's great, and it's a Matt Allen was a great captain because he led by example, didn't he? He, he would run through a brick wall and he tackled his granny for his football team, and um, and everybody appreciated. You know, I know we had the silky players at the back, like like Vino always wanted to wrap it through, and Jim would, wanted the ball off everybody, and the real could step in, and um, but Matty was that balancing core of of grit and you know like maybe like a, a Declan Rice does at, at, for England and at West Ham these days you know what I mean somebody who when he asked to put his foot in and, and be in the game he, he helped the team immensely and uh, and his, his leadership qualities were, were outstanding yeah 1997-98 had some positives David Johnson joined um, you scored the winner away to against Oxford in the in the League Cup which was a header from a Kieran Dyer cross in, in extra time um, <laughs> that also yeah. coincided with Jason Dazelle's last game. And I just wonder, you know, what, what it was like when 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 Jason came back for, for that short period of time. Yeah, listen, I, I think um, I, I'm a football man and I was aware of Jason Dazelle's, you know, what he'd achieved at the club and what he'd done. And he was a big name and it was exciting for people. Um, he was just a very, very good footballer. I would suggest that um, Kieran will tell you more about him. I, for me, he, he wasn't really there long enough for me to formulate an opinion where I can sit here and, and, and honestly say to you and the fans, oh, I, what a brilliant human being, what a brilliant footballer. I didn't know him that long other than I could see how elegant he was with the ball, really. He was a, he was just a high-quality footballer, but... Um, I know at Blackburn we tried to sign his son quite a bit, to be honest. He went to QPI in the end, didn't he? But um, um, yeah, the Dizel name really is, is synonymous with you know with with, with Ipswich. He, he obviously had, had, and you would tell me more than I would know really the history of of the real highs of of uh, Jason Dizel at, at, at that football club. But um, um, yeah, I, I, as I said, I liked all the footballers. George George put a lot of stock in in his recruitment. I would suggest generally he signed players who did well against his team. Um, Vino always said to me that you know he signed for us because George had said how good he was in games against us, and and uh, and I think John or David Johnson, you know, his son's obviously doing exceptionally well at the moment. Um, he probably he probably stuck one or two past me as well when he when Berry probably beat us. I don't know, but. I, I don't know. George George was good at recruitment. He he signed some good players. If you, if you look back, um, Jim McGill, like that, Matt yeah, Holland. how that team came together. It was, Rice, it was, John it was Marcus. pretty good, pretty good recruitment. I would have to say. January nineteen ninety eight. Um, your first return to Middlesbrough. Uh, we drew one one, um, and I remember being at that game, and you got a, a, a standing. A fantastic reception from from your home fans. How did that feel for you? Yeah, I think it's. Um, I think that things are always nice, you know. It's ultimately you want to not lose them football matches. You, you know, you you are with Ipswich Town, and you are desperate to do well going back. Especially, you know, I was there twelve years, I think, at Middlesbrough, and um, desperate as as recent really being a manager at Blackburn and going back for four or five years. I don't think we've ever lost, to be honest, at um, at the Riverside, and it's. Um, but maybe the players give a little bit more for you know, them days as a manager, and uh, as going back as a player, I, I can't really remember the game. I, I it's um, one each did we draw? Did you say? Yeah, didn't Fes Fester? Did he get sent off in that game? Did he? Right. Yeah. I, I, keep... I, I honestly doesn't ring a bell. I think I remember going back and getting a good reception, and um, and it's good that we didn't get beat. 
at um, as I, as I sit here now, I, I don't remember too many of the defeat. You can you can tell me some of them. We can chat about some of them. But I, I've only got fond memories of Ipswich Town. I think the people, the supporters, I only only fond memories. George, that team, the young players, the likes of Kieran Dyer, the likes of Darren Bent, Darren Ambrose coming through, Richard Wright. The, only positives and uh, what a, what an amazing football club and, and I genuinely sit here and and think that that club should very minimum be competing in the championship to get to the Premier League you know but you have to earn the right somewhere along the line over recent years there's been some mistakes made and, and the club as lots of clubs have Leeds United have found and Sheffield United and lots of big clubs Wolves they've all been down there Blackburn Rovers they've all been down in League One it's not an easy league to get out of, and you have to um, you have to get that special balance again to to know you carry the burden really of Kieran Dyer and, and Darren Bent, Richard. Right, you carry that burden of, and then players have to carry the burden of, of the, the amazing players that Bobby Robson won trophies with in in seventy eight and eighty one, and um, yeah, that's that's what it is to play for Ipswich Town. You know, it, it's like Nottingham Forest doing now back in the Premier League. You know, double. European Cup winners, well, Ipswich Town won the FA Cup and won the European Cup. I won the UEFA Cup, you know. So, uh, so modern-day players, they have to carry that burden. They have to take it with them and they have to, um, you know, follow in the footsteps. Did you ever, was it your easiest 90 minutes in February 1998 when the scoreline was Ipswich 5, Norwich City 0? Do you remember that game? <laughs> no, it was it a home game and I played, you know, we won 5-0. Who yeah, scored Alex. all the who, who scored all the goals? Alex, Alex got a hat trick and Bobby Petter got two. Right, wow. I guess it wouldn't it? your mate didn't play centre forward, did he that day? He was a big nah, Craig Bell. No, he'd left the game. Right? No, right. he was still there. He was injured, I think. All oh, right, okay. Darren Eady played. I, Darren Eady great played. for the great for the supporters of the club. Great days there. Listen, Alex Matthew, wow, you know, I, I forget names like that really. And yet they've they've been big players. It's um Alex Matthew knew where the back of the net was and could run in behind people, you know. It's it's interesting when you sit and you think about the qualities of footballers from a from a football manager's perspective rather than a teammate of what what they brought to the team. And, you know, and Alex Matthew was was like a um you know, he was held up there as if he was going to help us score the goals, win the match. He, he, he could he could score goals, Alex Matthews. He was good. But, um, no, but I, I don't know, is he, is he, a, is he a, a, somebody that the, the fans look back on and, and think, wow, I don't know how long Alex Matthews was there for. And yet, scoring a hat-trick against against Norwich, is uh, he should be, you know... A, he's, a, he's a bit of an icon because of the, good. the hat-trick, but I don't think he does the Radio Suffolk uh, commentary right. for away games, and every time he does commentary, Ipswich Town lose. So oh, God. Fans are not very happy. They're like, we don't want him on the radio no more. <laughs> right, okay. Goodness but that mate. game in particular, because I think that last six months is when Bobby had that purple patch. Yeah. He was just unplayable. Yeah. yeah. When I was Bobby about, Petty. Bobby yeah, Petty when I was, do that, though. Could yeah, you? but when I was saying about all the little work that you'd done about people who are actually realising and the help you gave him and the guidance. And I spoke to Bobby and he says that you're a big part to play. Yeah. That must, well, obviously I know you're humble and you wouldn't say that, that was down, you'll be oh. saying it's down to Bobby, but yeah, Bobby yeah. thinks that you had a massive part to play in him finally pushing through that barrier, which was, yeah. he was, un I felt, he was unplayable. I felt, as if he had, I felt as if he was quite a deep boy, Bobby, you know, mm. he was just very, very talented and he lacked a little bit of belief and confidence of how good he was. Yeah. And if any chats I ever had with Bobby was just to tell him, well, listen, mate, I've played at a, at a level where you can get there. And he, he did amazing. On his day, he was unstoppable. Eh? He went and did great things for Celtic as well, didn't he? And, yeah. But for Ipswich, he was, uh, on his day, he was an amazing footballer. Just just the ability to slow down, speed up, stuff that you could do. You know, acceleration was like amazing. And, yeah. and that's what catches footballers out. Footballers like me who... If I'm allowed to get hold of you or touch you or push you or use my body against you, but the fact that you could slow me right down and then boof, you're gone. You, I, you couldn't, you know, I, I needed to be full stride even just to get closer. And people like yourself and Bobby Petter, oh, they were a nightmare for big, strong defenders like me. Mm. Yeah, Bobby Petter, what a name. <laughs> um, 
you know, I'm trying to think of other names. You know, where's Fabian these days? What does Fabian Wilness do? It's um, He's coaching one of the teams at, uh, in Holland doing the under 18s. It might good? be PSV or because I know Martin Royster was was doing the national team under 17s, under yeah, 19, he was, yeah. like that, wasn't he? Yeah. I spoke to Martin about some players in Holland. So if we were wanting to sign players from Holland, I would, you know, you've got I, Romeo Zondervan. There's a blast from the past yeah. for Ipswich fans. Romeo He's was close. really close, to be honest. Yeah. The first person we picked the phone up to, me or Vino, would be to um, to speak to Romeo about a player who had great knowledge of every player out there. And if he didn't, he would phone somebody and they would know. And then we started phoning Martin about Dutch players as well. So, um it's good to have ex-teammates and ex-colleagues and people you know from other football clubs to to bounce opinions on players and their personalities around. It's good. We're trying to find Danny Sonner. No one knows where Danny Sonner is. <laughs> oh, oh, God. That's no surprise, Kieran, is it? Oh, oh my God. Vino might tell you where Danny Sonner exactly. is. You never know. Vino exactly. might know where he is. Well, goodness me, Danny Sonner. Listen, what an individual, what a character, eh? Yeah, he's it's played in the Premier League with Sheffield Wednesday, though, didn't he? It's he unbelievable. Backed he backed himself. <laughs> oh, God, what a lad. He was, but, uh, isn't it funny how you could talk? So the people who are listening, how you, if you could talk, tell truths and stories and real what people were like, you know. That, and you, listen, we, we don't as footballers give yeah. a point of real detail, but um, goodness me, Danny Sonner. <laughs> 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 he could do some great things. He could score some great goals. Or yeah. what a lad! What a character! Goodness, really. Anyway, that that five nil win against Norwich was in a run where we won ten out of the uh, the next eleven. We then went to Portsmouth away. We won one nil. Um, you came off as a sub in that game, and I was reading the program notes, and it doesn't look like you kind of had an injury because you talk about being on the sidelines and kind of wanting to get back in, which meant that it. Yeah. You missed the last six games of the season. Vino partnered Jason Cundy and included in those two games were two one nil defeats against Charlton in the in the playoffs. How, how was that for you watching that as a as a frustrated player? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, I, I was I, as you get older. I, I was. I'd like to think I was a team player. I would have wanted to play. Of course, I would have. Because as you're getting older, the games running out. The opportunities to play in big games are coming less and less. Um, but you want the team to win and. Listen, you're telling me Jason Cundy played in front of me, do you? Right, OK. I find that hard to take now, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Sydney, <laughs> Sydney here today. But um, listen, yeah. he, 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 Jason Cundy played for Chelsea and Tottenham. You know, he um, he had his qualities. He was a warrior, really. He was very physical. Um, now, whether he was a thinking footballer or a thinking man's football, I'm not sure, you know. But um, listen, it, the history book, that's what... That's what the job is managers pick teams. If I was frustrated and not playing, that's okay. Um, I, I think I only ever had one disagreement with George over, over all of them years I ever played at that club. Was he played me in a in a um, in a reserve game, an under twenty three game at Chelsea away one night, and the very next day, so here I was at 35, 36, playing away at Chelsea against a bunch of kids, and then the next day I came into training. And he had an 11 v 11 practice match and I had to play. And so I was playing offside on the halfway line like I would sometimes, you know, arm up, flag up, you're offside. Um, <laughs> and George didn't like it because I kept catching them offside and he sent me in. And um, anyway, it, 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 the man he is the next, the next day, the next morning, he, he came and found me and we just made up. But I was, I was just thinking, goodness, why, why are you a 36-year-old? I just played 90 minutes a game away at Chelsea in the reserves and you've made me play in a good game on the, uh, the very next day. I, I was definitely going to be playing offside on the halfway line all game. You know what I mean? It's uh, And he didn't like it, but because it spoiled the session, really, what he was trying to do. But um, we made up very quickly. And, and uh, you know, and, and Jason Cundy, I listen to him on talk sports sometimes. Uh, you know, good luck to him. And uh, he had a really good career to think that he played for such... You know, massive clubs like Chelsea and Tottenham, and then um, you know came to Richard. I don't know how Jason's career did. Jason gone by the time we got promotion to the Premier League. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, never mind. Good on him. Uh, 1998, 99. Here's a couple of names of players that joined: Marco Holster and Manu Thetis or Teti, however you mm. like to right. pronounce Thetis, it. Right, Thetis. Yeah, big yeah. Manu. Came to replace me, I think, didn't he? I'm not sure. Where it's um... well, we'll. We'll get to a game a little bit later that I want to kind of speak to you about. But by the end of the December 1998, Town were in second 
Um, uh, Titus Bramble had made his, uh, about to make his debut. Uh, Fabian Wilness was joining. Uh, Jim McGilton was joining. You'd scored two more goals away at Berry and, and away at Swindon. And was there a thought then that actually this was this was our season that we were going to go one better and actually maybe at least get to the the playoff final? Yeah, you, listen, you'd also we had four years on the bounce, didn't we? Get into playoffs, and um, you say Titus was about to Titus Bramble. You know, Kieran obviously was good friends with Titus. Titus, uh, what a what a monster of a footballer, a man you know could do all the attributes, the assets. You know, a wonderful kid. Whether he had I talk about the thinking man's brain, really. You know, I was I was an old player who knew where to stand, where to go. Titus was just fast and could catch anybody and tackle anybody and um, physically dominate people. Um, the, you know, the additions were good. George, George, as I said, it was good at recruitment without really having. Um, you know, he had Charlie Woods with him for a lot of time, didn't he? And uh, then Charlie went and, and worked Tot- with Bobby and, and um, went to Tottenham first. Gaffer. Yeah. Because yeah. that's when they, they signed Tarico that transfer window. That's right, yeah. Um, but but I just thought the recruitment was good at the club over my whole period. Really. Yeah. yeah, there's a no manager in the world gets everybody right, do they? There is some players who come and don't really impact and don't get a game and drift out. But generally, George bought good footballers that suited the way he wanted to play and the team was just kept developing and growing. The fact that, you know, I, I used to say to every, every club director... The, the fact that we sell our best player at Ipswich Town, re, reinvest some of the money back in the team and end up getting promoted. And that's the way they should do it. That's part of the reason I left Blackburn, really, was, you know, Adam Armstrong got sold and we didn't get anything out of 15 million. And Ben Brown will get sold this summer. And we the, the club probably wouldn't give the, the manager, I don't know how much they're going to give the manager, but they weren't talking of giving the manager any money to reinvest. I think sell Kieran Dyer, bring in three or four players, the team gets better with total respect to the best player. Let him go and play in the Premier League and do what he does and enjoy it at the top and try and win trophies. The team should sell, take the money, reinvest, get some players that you can polish up and make better and the team will get better. And that's how I like to do it. Because bottom line, why would you want to keep a young Kieran Dyer, you know, kicking his heels when he knows he could be playing in the Premier League with the great players? So let him go. Make sure you get the right money for him. Reinvest it back in the team and the team will just keep improving and that's the way you should do it, I think. And so certain clubs won't sell players, I understand, but generally the top, top clubs and they can afford to turn down massive bids. But I think clubs like Ipswich Town, with total respect to them, should not worry about selling their best player as long as the recruitment's good and they have a good eye and the, the money is reinvested back into the team to help with the department. Uh, what was Jim Jilton like? <laughs> well, listen, you look what Jim Jilton. I, I, you know, again, I go back to that thing. I love Jim Jilton. It's, it's a bit strong, the word, but I could also hate him at some times as well because he, he needed a filter, really. You know, he, he could go off on one with anybody. Um, I think the emotion and passion for the game, he's, a, he's, a, he's an Irishman, you know, he's, um, he's full of passion and emotion. He was good for Ipswich Town, he wanted the ball off everybody. He'd run 70 yards just to get a side foot pass to give it back to somebody and then run another 60 yards to get a touch. So um, he was good for that team. He scored some pretty crucial goals in the lead up to ultimately getting promotion, I think. And um, we all liked him. Was he on my, you know, if you talk about cliques, I wasn't, I don't think I was in a clique at all, but. He didn't live his life as I lived my life, but he lived his life that suited a lot of the players, you know, a lot of the lads, you know, in a social aspect around Jim. Jim, you couldn't not be affected by Jim Magilton, I would say, and the personality and the character. Um, but he was a type of footballer. He had a wonderful feel in his feet. He wasn't the most mobile in the world. He couldn't do what Kieran could do, go up and down and accelerate away from people. But he was brave as the, with the ball and wanted to play and he, he got our team ticking. Centre halves behind him, two of them, the outside ones who would give him the ball in areas. He would play off his back foot, see forward passes, slide good passes, good dead ball delivery. Jim McGill was a good footballer for Ipswich Town, very good. Before we get to Kieran's last two games in the the playoff defeat, uh, playoff aggregate defeat against Bolton, I want to speak to you both uh, about crew at home. April 1999, we were we were we were close to 
promotion. They 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 came and, and beat us two one, and and for me that was always a sort of a sliding doors moment. Can you remember that game, either of you? No. I True at all. Yeah, uh, Jermaine Wright. That's probably why we signed Jermaine Wright that summer. He run the game. Um, I just come back from my broken leg. I think we had a game at home that was on Sky just before that, and we won one nil. But we didn't play great. Jim McGilton got man in the match. And then we played crew and it was like where I could run all day and fitness. I, that was my first big injury. And I was like struggling and I think I give the ball away for the second goal or something. And I can remember after the game speaking to George and was like, I think you should leave me out for the next game. It was like, I've never experienced it. My body's not yeah. doing what it's supposed to do, but. If you look at it, crew were near the bottom of the league. That we, if we won that game, we'd have, we would have got promoted. So I took that quite hard on myself. Um, again, not yeah. knowing it takes you three or four games to get up to speed. Obviously, George put me straight back in. Um, even the game before against Bristol, I just felt way off it. And then at the time, no disrespect, I didn't know Jermaine Wright, and I'm like going, "Who how the hell is he run popping me off the pitch? Like, who is yeah. this guy?" Yeah. But um, yeah, that was that game is one of the big regrets in my Ipswich yeah. career because if we win that, we we go up, but yeah. it wasn't to be. But we, got, talk, we got Jermaine right out of it at the end of the yeah. day. He turned out to be a fantastic player for Ipswich, so he probably owes me half of his contract for getting him. <laughs> <contract. laughs> so, did we play Bolton two years on the bounce in the semi final of the playoffs? Then, did we? Was that the year no, before? No, we played Charlton. We put so Charlton when Charlton and Donker had the game, we lost to Charlton. We lost to Sheffield United the first year, Charlton the second year, and then we lost to Bolton. And then the year you won, you played Bolton the following year. Yeah, because that was some game, wasn't it? The, the, yeah. the promotion game. I mean, the, even, the one before even, that. Even the Bolton game that we lost, I. Like I said, I think Charlton thoroughly deserved to beat us over two legs. But yeah. I thought we were the better team against Bolton over the two mm. legs. But Bolton had a good team as well. Good they team then, Johnson yeah. And they had yeah. the other um, Scandinavian Genston. midfielder. Yeah, good players. Yeah. They were a good yeah, team. They were. That was a proper game. That was yeah. a proper game. Thank, thank goodness for David Sheepshanks for um, petitioning the FA to change the away goal rule after, after that game. <laughs> um, so if we get to... Well, before we get to the start of 1999-2000, and you've, you've kind of hinted about it, about, you know, selling your best players and, and reinvesting yeah. in them. Uh, Kieran goes off to, to Newcastle. So kind of interested on your thoughts about him and, you know, what you thought of him as a player, but also two of the players that came in at that point, which is John McGreal and, and obviously Jermaine Wright. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I think Kieran was always going to move you know you might say if we'd have got promotion the year before he might have stayed in the Premier League with the club I'm not sure but um, I think I think for, well, I, I think I can even remember the one of the first days he came and trained with us you know he, you could it was there right in front of your eyes this kid was so fast he could run all day and yet he was the fastest player and um, and he knew what he was doing with the ball I use Kieran as an example to a lot of footballers that uh, you only had to tell him once and he would do it. If he felt that it was right, he would do it. He didn't, you know, one of these lads who you go next game, I told you, make you run there. I told you you have to do that. And he'd keep doing the same thing that doesn't get them in. Kieran would learn very, very, very quickly. And um, and I use that almost as a measuring gauge for any footballer who, if they understand the game and they learn it and they can see it benefits them, they use it next game and next game and then they use it until somebody figures them out and they have to do some different Um Learned very, very, very fast, Kieran, and um, had all the attributes to be a top player: the speed, the mobility, the 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 energy to keep going for ninety minutes. Um, if anything, I suppose you know, in the England thing, I used to get frustrated when I see him playing right wing back. You know, it's um, and that was only because he had the energy to do it, and he was playing in a generation of some amazing midfield players. Um, but you had to have Kieran Dyer in the team, in my opinion, with its. Um, just with those attributes that he had and then the confidence that he, that he gained when he was doing really well. Um, but I, I, I said, I always stand by football clubs shouldn't stand in the way of players in my mind if they're doing exceptionally well. I know there's contracts, you sign contracts and, um, uh, and clubs are always can always 
stand by their contracts of, of players. If someone's got a five-year deal, they've just given them a five-year deal and they want to move next week, then no, that's, that's out of order, really, I suppose. But uh, let Kieran let his talent do the talking, really. And then clubs have to pay money. That, that's the right number that the club that he's leaving can then reinvest. And actually, the manager has a chance to, um, to make the team even stronger by strengthening two or three different positions as opposed to just losing one player in one position, strengthening two or three positions. And, and I think that's what George did and helped the team. And, and ultimately, we managed to get over the line, even though for a few years we could have got over the line. We did the year after. Because I'd never even heard of John McGrill as well. <laughs> no disrespect no. to John McGrill. No. He's, no. What was it? You've talked about how confident he was on the ball and yeah. you had the perfect blend with him and Vino either side. And, yeah. And Jermaine, no, was good. Don't yeah, the balance of the team was good, Kieran. Yeah. No, John could step in with the ball, really. You know, didn't stand with it and just pass it. If, if there was space in front, he could step in. So he was affecting the midfielders and the opposition. And he could slip it to Jim and then he'd flip it around the corner and all of a sudden, whoever it was, Marcus Stewart had dropped off and, and John was running in behind. And, and the team functioned pretty well. You could see the pattern of the team and the players were fitting into the, into the, uh, the system really well. Which, which, which functioned and, and okay so you weren't there and yet we had different ways of getting through really it's um, it just, that's that's why I know George was such a good manager he could he could build a different team with different players yeah. didn't just have to rely on you breaking you know 70 yard runs and breaking the box and, and beating three men and slipping somebody in we um, we could play differently and it was it was really really impressive of George I would suggest when uh, Marcus Stewart comes, because Jono had been the main guy for goals, yeah. and we yeah. all know he's a confident. How oh, was it? Did he take that in his stride, or was it was a bit of a oh, a competition? Of <coughs> now, because all strikers no. to be the top goal scorer, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I, I I can't really remember a, um, <laughs> a sort of any sort of standoff between them or any frustration with Jono. I think. I think you have to appreciate Marcus Stewart's intelligence as a footballer and the totally different animal he was to John O, who could use his his uh, speed and his power and burst in behind. And, and his big fat know. bum. Yeah, exactly. And he knows that. That's where his power came from, I suppose. But he could leap and he could sprint and he could run and he could wag it. Um, whereas Marcus was just delicate and deft and come into little pockets, but he could, he could spring as well and score with his head. He was a brave lad and um, he was a good team player. You couldn't not like Marcus Stewart, to be honest. He was uh, he wanted to be part of the team. He wanted to help the midfielders. And, you know, he'd, he'd be talking to the fullbacks about where he's going to make his run and when they were going to deliver in wide areas. He was a good team player, Marcus Stewart. And um, I'd known that through playing against him. You know, he was, he was uh, deft is the right word, a little glance here, a little touch there always running across your last second. You didn't know if you weren't always checking your shoulder, he'd be pulling off the back and as you looked, he'd go and he'd be nicking in front of you and scoring him with a little toe poke. He was a clever footballer. <clears throat> and I think, if anything, he combined well with Jono because Jono would create the space with the, the speed or the threat of speed in behind. Um, I think yeah. the season I left, I think the season I left uh, Gaffer, um, Scoey gets player of the year. That year right, as well, well, so it has to show. Yeah. And obviously, Scoey was, Sco 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 was a developer as well, though, wasn't he? Again, mm. a young lad who came through the, the you know, with Chloe and with Sarge, it um, came through that and had a good mentality to want to try and get better. Scoey, Sco did he did he fulfil his, his full potential? Probably not, did he? You know, mm. he's he was a big lad with a nice touch and Oh, probably like too nice a lad. Yeah, George anything, used yeah? to be on him all the time, didn't he? Yeah, he used to be on yeah. him all the time about being too nice. Yeah, I like Scoy though. You know, I, I do keep in touch with Scoy so nice. He's he's in touch with me, and um, he's he's a he's a nice kid, Scoy. I like. I say that I don't know. He's not a kid anymore, is he? But it's um, yeah. Generally, it's good as I've said you right at the start. There, I generally like footballers because they're good people and. Um, I know, you know, it's even your own story, Kieran. I know your, your heart, you're a good human being. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and people who don't know how your life went regarding the money or whatever it is, you, you, did you make some mistakes along the way? Probably. And yet I, I know, this is why I keep in touch with you and I like to talk to you. I know you're a good guy. I know you're a good human being. 
and whatever mistakes you made along the way, I forgive them because I know in in your heart you're a good man, and um, and that's all I ask of people really. My footballers, when I'm managing them, try and be good guys, eh? And if they're not, if they're devious, if they're sneaky, if they're telling you lies, if they're ducking and diving, I get rid of them. Yeah. But um, and that's dangerous because I might get rid of the best player, but For I would team. rather have everybody that's fighting and pulling in the same direction personally. And that, and you might see, you could easily argue that, Kieran, to say, ah, you're never going to win a the league then, Gaffer. You're never going to do this because, because you need the best players. And sometimes the best players are individuals and they are not necessarily team players, but they'll win you the games and they'll get you the league title. But, um, well, Arteta's just showed it with Aubameyang. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I agree. Our best player, but if you're not going to yeah. stick to the rules and break, I don't care. Yeah. I'll be, uh, see you later. Yeah. yeah. I think that's. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's the best way. Other people might not think so. They other people. Some some managers like managing. You know, mavericks if that's what yeah. we're going to call them. But um, um, I would prefer to have the team all pulling in one direction. Some players are better than others. Some players have got much better qualities. Um, I say to the team, you talk about uh, Bradley Dak at, at Blackburn Rovers. I would tell the team, just give the ball to Dak. This is before his injuries. Just give the ball to Dak because invariably he made the right decision. He turned the right way. His pass, way the pass was brilliant. He would whack it in the top corner without looking and give him the ball. Why are you, with total respect to you, why are you trying to beat him? Just give it to Dak. And if you keep running, he'll put it right in front of you for a tap in. Just, just give him the ball, mate. That's how I would talk to them with no ego around it other than we want it to win. So if you want to win, give it to Kieran Dyer. Give it to Bradley Dak. Give it to the players who can make a difference on the game and we'll win and we'll all celebrate afterwards together. Mm. That's how I see football. I, yeah. I, it's, it makes sense to me. I was a big centre-half who would win headers and, and defend. I knew I wasn't the match winner, I, but I wanted to keep a clean sheet out the team try and win. So if you've got a special player, give him the ball and see if he can stick it in the other net. Yeah. Ipswich fans often remember in 1999-2000, like you say, the signing of Marcus Stewart and, and Martin Royce are coming in, etc. Yeah. But I think a, an important change was made in, in October of that season. Uh, you were brought back. It was your first start. We beat Charlton 4-2. The team had just lost four of the, the, the previous six and, and, and lost 4-1 at home to, to QPR. Um, you came in from, from Manu Fetis and... Uh, there, there was conversations about, you know, that particularly in that situation, that he didn't take that particularly very well. Do you remember about that? Because for me, it was a, it was a key moment in our season. Right. Um, Manu was Manu was. I felt it was a was a good guy. I think he was French African. I'm not sure what nationality he was. Yeah, um, speaking, he used to just go. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, George had to deal with him. I didn't have to deal with him, you know. George was the manager. It's um Manu was a big strong man who, who wanted to play. You know, again, I go back to this thing. I, I like football intelligence personally. You know, I like to sign players who, who understand when you talk tactics, when you do give them a reason why they have to come short to go long or come inside so the fullback can come round you. I like thinking footballers, um, Manu was just a big, strong man. I'm not sure he was a thinking footballer. That was all. It's, and that's not a criticism of him. That's he could, he could get really tight to people and he could bully them off the ball. Yeah, that's OK. But I'm not sure he thought about where he was on the pitch, why he should go tight, why he should drop off in this instance. And, um, and listen, I'm very wary of... I'm not critical of any any footballer. It, it, it's other than some footballers are better than others, and some footballers have a different tool that helps the team win a game or be more competitive. And I personally felt that my game knowledge would have helped the team more than Manu's manly, physical monstrosity of a guy who could physically dominate people. That's all. And um, if I came back in and the team started to click again whether that was the, the key. I'm, probably not. It was probably a combination of things and other people who, who um, put, it was probably the chemistry of the team started to function better, probably. We fast forward to May 2000, Walsall at home in the, in the, in the league. We win 2-0, but we miss out to, to Bradford, who, who finished second. Um, I guess really 
I know you've probably been asked this question quite a number of times, but how did it feel to be... That's wrong there, by the way. Bradford come second in my last season. That right. Did the... Yeah. Bradford. Who would play for... Who, who came to Sunderland, Bradford? was it? I don't know who comes second that year, to be honest. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll look it up quickly. Um, but yeah, just generally, how did you feel with the... Uh, uh, Walsall? Yeah, yeah, Walsall, yeah, at home, and who... A small team. I, I can see why I forgot them. I'll leave this bit in. Man City. Oh, um, wow. wow. All right. Okay. Quality. <laughs> right, okay. Um, I, I, were we ever in the race to finish second? Or are you say, right, are you saying it was that last day almost? Or yeah. Just before yeah. the last year. Right. But listen, it'll be hugely disappointing because we've been there three years on the bounce. This is four years on the bounce. We've been there and there about. I think it's really hard to consistently stay at the top end of the table. Look at the championship today. You know, I've, I've been sitting looking at the championship over the last few days. I know I'm not involved in it this season at the start anyway, but, um, you know, can you look beyond Norwich or Watford, you know, Burnley, the, the relegated teams? I think Middlesbrough are going to, you know, probably spend, if Spence gets sold, probably spend the Spence money and so they'll be strong and they get the right strikers because they're, they're strong everywhere else. And um, Sheffield United, you know, it's it's tough though I think to stay at the top year after year and then suffer the disappointment and then bounce back and do it again and bounce back and do it again. Um, I think I think the club did really really well. I think George did amazingly well to keep the team there and thereabouts. We'd have been hugely frustrated and disappointed not to have got promoted that season. But um, yeah, that's and ultimately we got there. My thoughts are about them them. Bolton Wanderers games really I think I got injured in the first game we were 2-0 we two down we came back to each I came off at 2-0 down I think I got concussion or whatever it was and um, but I, I just, thankfully I, the bit I remember of the, the game at home is nodding one down for Jim to score one of the goals a long ball forward I'd gone up and nodded it down and he uh, volleyed it in or volleyed it in and um, so I felt a little bit better as if I'd contributed to the team getting through what was a an unbelievable game, wasn't it? With all the was it penalties or sending offs or whatever it was. I know Sam wasn't very happy after the game. How 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 the games changed. He comes off of a concussion and he plays four days later. That yeah. would be happening today. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. But um, listen, they had good players, as Kieran said. You know, good good Johnson and people like that. Well, they they had a good team, to be honest. You know, the left back was a flyer and. Um, Oh, yeah, Ricketts. We did really, really well to dig in and see that game out, really. And I think it was the characters, you know, myself, play, but you know, Magilton and people like this really dug in that day. You know, it, it was a it was a massive game um, against a big team with players with big expectation, and we came out we came out on top. And um, yeah, it was it was it was a great feeling, I think, that day. Barnsley, I can't remember how Barnsley, I know we obviously beat Barnsley in the end, I can't remember how Barnsley's season went, were Barnsley always up there, were, were we favourites to beat Barnsley, I can't remember the final other than, I, I, you know, yeah. how did Barnsley we them in the league, didn't we, I think we yeah, beat, beat them in the league, yeah, right, As well, one of the questions I've got about the, he was a good player, Craig Ignat for them, yeah, he? yeah, he, he scored the first goal, or what he did, he hit it right on the back, didn't he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before we get to your, your Wembley bit, the one bit I've always wanted to ask you is, at, at what point in the game did you or George Burley say, uh, I need to go up front now? Who, who made that decision? <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think George would have ever done that. I, I would have just seen how the game was, was rolling, really. I don't think George waved me up. I'm not sure. I think... Um, when you're in such a in a like a, a semi final game that's you're you're in or you're out, it's uh, you have to make them decisions. You know, you think about goalies going up last minute and stuff like that, don't you? I don't know the answer to, to your question. It's too long ago, but I'm just pleased it happened. And um, and you know, you, I still feel proud of that team that we could come through a game like that. Really, um, I don't. I don't know. I, I read somewhere recently about. You know, how, how fuming Allardyce was about that game and how the decisions went against him. And, and I felt as if, um, you know, as I can feel it from the manager's aspect where you wind your team up. You are desperate to win. You have to do everything and anything to win. And I felt Bolton were probably like that. Sam's, that's his mould, I think, to get his team to, 
to play with the dark arts. And they probably just overstepped the mark, did they not? And the referee that night was doing what he felt was right, that they were overstepping the mark and some decisions went our way. And um, yes, it's in the history books we got through and we, uh, we, we had a good time after that. <laughs> Um, Fast forward to, to Wembley. Um, now you you can tell me firsthand because I, I didn't go to that game and there's a story to that, but not for your pod. Um, <laughs> the questions I've got for you is, what did you feel like when we were one nil down? How did it feel when when you scored? And the question I've got at the end, when we when we won, how how did you feel when Matt Holland was there, lifting the trophy? Um, did you think that? Potentially, you'd you'd kind of missed out on an opportunity there. No, no. Let's answer the first one, the last one first. Never in a million years, I was, I was just so proud and happy of the club. Really, I'd been on that journey for them four years in the playoffs with them. It's uh, the heartache of it. The fans, the, the colour of the stadium that day was amazing. You know, red and blue split down the middle. It was just everybody I knew and loved was there, and um, just to be a part of it was so special. At one nil down. You always have demons in football. Such big games, God, it's not going to go away. It's, you know, you, you 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 fight the demons in your brain. I used to. Of what if it goes wrong? What if we can't do it this day? You no, know, and they scored off the bar, right on the back, and it's in, and um, they're celebrating. Um, Jono gets injured as well. There you go. Jono gets injured. Who came on? Bam Bam. Bam Bam. He was unbelievable yeah. as well. And, um, yeah, he was unbelievable. And Richard Neal with that type of player could be unbelievable on his day. Yeah, monster of a kid. But um, I think relief to score the equaliser because we were we were back in it. We were you know we weren't going to get beat. We were in it. We had as good a chance as they did. And um, and then it gives the team the confidence to start playing. I think. And we did start playing, and the, the quality of the football that we had on the pitch again with the with the centre halves with um, you know, either side of me, I'm talking, not me. The centre halves, Majilton, you know, Jermaine Wright, Matty Holland. It, 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 Marcus Stewart, you always felt could score. I think John coming off was a blow because John you felt could score. It's um, it's a big pitch. It was a red hot scorching day. Ultimately, I think the quality showed really. Um, we had to keep their, their strikers quiet. Um, I think Shipley played up front, big strapping lad. Um, I felt we controlled it for long spells and we were all right in the game. I, the most nerve wracking thing was, you know, when I give a penalty away, it, um, from being 3 1 up and being pretty comfortable, 3 2 was the scariest time then you know, I don't know how long it was was it 20 minutes we had to see out or 10 minutes I'm not sure but they were really coming for us really it was coming in our box we were having to edit we were blocking things they were coming for an equaliser they were right on the, on the front foot from being 3-1 down and out of it to 3-2 and believing they were going to get back in and we were out on our feet really it was scorching I was you know you said what 36 and now however many hundred days and um, I was out on my feet giving a penalty away and thinking oh god and the joy and relief of us breaking away to score the fourth goal was, you know, some of that will live with you forever, really. And just, I think all around the stadium, everybody in blue felt huge relief that day, that fourth goal going in. And we'd eventually done it because it felt like a journey that had gone on for four years of missing out in playoffs, missing out in playoffs, missing out in playoffs, and then eventually doing it. Um, it was great. It was great to see and, and, and great to be a part of, really. When you score, when you score, Gaffer, and you, you're obviously emotion and you kind of look at the air with your celebration, was that yeah. for Bernadette or? Yeah. yeah, it was for Bernadette. Yeah. yeah. I think that thing never leaves you, Kiri, um, however yeah. many years. So, 90, 90, uh, 94. 2004, 2014, 20, you know, 20, how many years? Like 28 years ago, 27 years ago. Yeah. It's, it never leaves you, mate. It's, um, yeah. Yeah. And so in a football emotion, I always feel as if people are there helping and okay. watching. Yeah, really. yeah. So, uh, but I was also very conscious of where my family and the people and, and my lovely wife here, Amber, who's now actually cooking the dinner over there, aren't you free that? <laughs> uh, was in the stand that day as well. And, um, you know, life is good now. We've we've got three boys. I watch them play footy. I'm trying to be a good dad and um, and a good husband and getting on with our lives. Really, 
football is always going to be burning away, really. So here I am. I took a decision to step away from it in the summer there after you know we finished eighth in the championship after being second in in middle of February. Um, Brenton Diaz picked up an injury, missed twelve games, and uh, we, the goals dried up a little bit. But um, I'll be back soon. I think. I hope. Anyway, you know, I, I would never be presumptuous to you know because. To get a job, somebody needs to lose a job, and that's the sadness of football management. But it is football management, and um, and I'll wait patiently, um, try and enjoy some time with my family, and and when the time's right, um, try and get back in and, and and try and create a culture and an environment in a football club that can be successful. That was ultimately your your last goal for Ipswich. So you you're alongside Roger Osborne is scoring your last goal for Ipswich at, at, at Wembley. And, and like I said, you are the the oldest goal scorer this this century. Um, you you mentioned it's a, it's a great it's a great stat. I think it is. You meant you mentioned about um you know the, the difficulty of management and stuff and the and the first opportunity that you got to to sit in the dugout. Obviously, uh, George Burley was, was sacked after losing at Grimsby. You came in against Sheffield Wednesday and had four games, and obviously you, you've you both had four games as you know caretaker management or you know management teams, or whatever. How how was that? How how did you feel that that went? Um, oh, how did it, how did I feel it went? Well, you're not prepared, I don't think. You're a, you're a you're a coach and and you're gaffer and you're mate, really. You know, George was never really a mate, but he's somebody a huge respect for. You know, I'd played for for them years and um, and had lots of telling conversations with about football and the team and uh, and then for whatever reason he was he was gone it's thrust upon you really that you haven't got a preparation time the game's coming and um, yeah I, as I sit here now I couldn't honestly tell you how the results went we lose we we drew we won we win one we lost one or two I don't know I can't remember how they went but um, you, you, you won at home at Sheffield Wednesday Pablo scored a scored a couple yeah Lose three okay. one at Reading. Uh, we yeah. draw two two at home at Burnley, and then Gillingham we lose one nil at home to them. Yeah. Mamadi okay. Sadibi scored. Right, okay. Yeah. Listen, I I, it, I don't sit there and even judge them games in my football management career. To be honest, my my, my management career started at Hibs because I was ready, I was prepared, I was I, I you try and put a team together. You have a pre season, you prepare the team. You don't get thrust in and however many days later you you have to try and put a team together to win a football match after the results have obviously been bad enough for the previous manager to move it. This is the sadness of football really. It's like, so when I get a job again, whenever it might be, it's probably because the team is struggling. You have to create an environment, engineer a, a togetherness, um, lift the, the mood really. You have to get amongst the group um, and I was already like a fixture with the group. So it's very difficult to make a, an immediate impact, an immediate change, really. I probably would have told them that I believed in them this and that they're good players for whatever reason and, and not changed too much. I, I, I genuinely sit here and I can't remember if I did make many changes. But um, my personality would probably be to try and give them a lift and tell them how good they are and what they should be achieving. And... Um, Try and get them going that way. The longer term, you create a culture of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what you can do, what you can't do, how we prepare, what how we play forward. Um, when do we put the ball in the box? When do we be patient? I think the time span's too too short to be able to put an indelible mark on a football team over four games. And um, I, I was I'm pretty relaxed about that. You know, I, to be fair. Joe Royal came in. I I enjoyed Joe Royal and, and Willie Donachy. I worked pretty closely with Willie Donachy. Joe was good enough to keep me on, and um, I, he didn't see me as a threat. Of course, I, I, I think that was the scenario, and I, I enjoyed the different management style of Joe Royal to George Burley. To be honest, Joe's a totally different type of manager, and um, Willie was his coach who did everything on the grass. Um, it was like I, I saw it as a learning curve before going into my next stage in my life and my career, really. Um, and, and like every manager is a learning curve, you have to decide what you take from each one and what you dismiss from each one and how you were going to do it. And I pretty much try to think about my management style and be true to my own human qualities, I think. Um, 
it's like whenever I go for interviews or job interviews as, as, as over my managerial career, I just take myself. I don't take PowerPoints. I don't take any sheets of paper about the team or what I would do next game, blah, blah, blah. I take myself and talk about building and creating a culture and things like recruitment you have to get right. Things like we've talked about, if you're going to sell a player, don't be afraid to sell a player. Um because you, t it's an opportunity to improve the team, use the funds, keep keep developing and growing the football club, and um, and reap the rewards down the line. Um, so yeah, my four games in Ipswich, I I, I I I sort of dismiss them as managerial games for me because I don't see it's uh, it was thrust upon me, and I was the guy in the dugout who, who had to do the interviews after the game, win, lose, or draw. Touching back on the, when you talked about you don't do presentations, I think it was you who told me at the time as well, is that even though the clubs are interviewing you for a job, why you like to sit down and chat? Because you're getting a sense of them. It's like yeah, you're interviewing absolutely. them. Could you work with yeah. these couple of people? Which that always yeah. stuck with me and something I will, I yeah. would definitely take forward. I think you need to do that, Kieran, in any job. Because the reality kicks in. Once you sign that piece of paper, and then they go off in their suits and sit in their offices and you put your tracksuit on, you go on that grass, it's just you. And mm. so what you don't want, as, as, and listen, I don't like them phoning me up after games and stuff like that when my emotions are riding high. Win, lose or draw, I don't want to talk to the men in suits after the game. If they want to come and see me on Monday and we chat about the match and stuff, no problem. Um, don't phone me in your car on the way home for the game because I ain't answering my phone. And, and I'll tell them them sort of things at the start so they know what they're dealing with. And then when they give me the job, they don't phone me. Yeah. Um, because it's too emotional. Football is emotional. I'll say something that I don't want to say. They'll criticise things and I'll be thinking, you you idiot. You know what I mean? It's um, So uh, let's discuss it on Monday, whether the team did well. And everybody's calmed down. Everybody's rational. And that's the way to do it, really. And um, Because... Hopefully you've got a plan. Hopefully you know where you're going and what you're doing and why it, the the defeat on Saturday, why why it happened. You can talk about it and you, you know what's what where you're trying to get to anyway. Um, yeah, I, I like to like people I work with, Kieran. And I, you know, I suggest if you're going to go into management or coaching, you should like the people or respect them anyway, um, and get a feel for them right at the start. I think because otherwise, it's a it's it's a lonely place, football management or even coaching when it's your team and you aren't getting support from above and if you're not winning, it's a lonely, lonely place. And um, you've got to make sure that the people around you are there and helping you and supporting you. Because your staff will do that anyway. Yeah, you've, you, Your close staff will do that for you, but you need support from above at times. And um, that's not every football club. Yeah. Conscious of the fact that your your dinner sounds like it's close, so we'll move on to just a few um, few uh, fan questions. Just a uh, the fans question: Why didn't you play in the Premier League with Ipswich? I, because I was, <laughs> I, um, I was probably finished, Kieran. I was probably finished. I was I, was I thirty seven when that season started, and um, and the, the the story practice match on a Friday really on the pitch we were away at Tottenham I think for Skier when we having I Vino scored in the end didn't he but um, mm -hmm. I was in the team where I was playing in the middle of that back three and <laughs> we got absolutely battered off um, off the second string really the team that George put out to play against us and I was terrible I couldn't move I felt stiff I felt aching I, I shouldn't have been playing I hadn't done a proper pre-season you know where I was being sick on the side or throwing up because I was working that hard I wasn't in condition to play at 37 and um, I remember after, after it was after the session, the session finished and um, we had a conversation and decided that Herman should play, you know, and, uh, and that's, Herman Ryerson is a, a, is a man, mountain of a man who could run all day, he was strong and powerful and, um, and that, you know, so he was me talking about Salibio football as thinking guys, um, the balance of a thinking footballer but no legs at all, really. You, you can't. You have to have a combination of. And, and so the decision was made. I didn't play, and and I enjoyed that. That was an amazing season for Ipswich Town in the Premier League. And if we'd have won that last game of the season, we'd have finished third. You know, it's uh, ended up finishing fifth, I think. And um, just you know, to win away Anfield and stuff like that was it was it was amazing for the club. And um, had a great season. And 
and uh, I was, you know, proud to be involved and, and be around George and, and his staff that, that that season. Yeah, I think the I think the key question that's that's coming out from the fans is: what, Have you ever been close to becoming Ipswich Town manager in the past? Um, or oh, I have, I'm trying to think. I've I, I've met I've met the people. I'm trying to. I'm struggling to tell you who I met. Um. So the answer to that is, is maybe yes, but but um, I think it, I think it was after Le- I think, and I'm not sure. I think it was. I shouldn't really say it if I'm not 100 percent sure. But I think it was after leaving Celtic. What happened is, I never had a football agent really. Um, I just backed my talent to go and manage football clubs and teams. And I, we know the story. I went to Celtic. I was there just under a year, um, and it, without even knowing, because I would just say, right, I'll just sign whatever the contract says, I'm signing. I never worried. I never had agents wanting to get me this much money and wanting to do this. I just signed the contract that they put in front of me. And when I left Celtic, I found I was um, I was on garden leave because there was no agents, there was no lawyers, no solicitors. Like modern day, everything is looked over by the LMA and whether it's your agent or your solicitors or whatever it is, looks after every word on a contract. What happened was I was on garden leave and uh, I'd signed a five-year deal at Celtic and uh, within a year I was out. Um, and if I'd signed another contract for another club, they, they could stop paying me on the terms of the deal. And I felt pretty hurt by what happened at Celtic and how it unravelled. Um, and when Ipswich came along, um, and it wasn't, yes, this is your job, it was a chat really. I'd made my mind up that I was not going to let Celtic away with um, the garden leave clause. And I I didn't go back for maybe six months. They had to keep paying me. Whereas if I'd have signed another job, um, I was emotionally hurt as well, I would have to say to you. It, it, was, it was a tough time. And I probably wasn't ready to go back in to manage Ipswich Town or whoever it was. Um, so I stayed on my garden leave and I got paid. Um, and then... Middlesbrough job came along really, and that was my hometown team. I'd seen maybe six, seven, eight months of that garden leave out. Um, I still give up a lot of money to to um, to sign for Middlesbrough, I think. But I think that was the closest Ipswich situation ever came along. But it was never offered to me. It was never, you know, a done deal. And I said no. It was just a discussion, really. Um, Listen, it'll always be close to my heart. I, I support the manager who's doing the job, really. I, it's not been cheesy. It, it is, I know how hard the job is, and I, I hope every manager can do well, but the reality is it's we're in a league and somebody has to be at the top and somebody has to be at the bottom, and somebody isn't going to be achieving the goals and ambitions of that club at some stage, and so that's why other managers get opportunities. Um, I hope it switches now with Kieran on a, on a, on an upward spiral all its way back to the Premier League and they don't change the manager for, you know, the next 10 years. Um, so let's hope Ipswich is, is is on the up and going in the right direction and supporting the manager and they're being very successful. Um, and nobody will be more happy than me than uh, if, if Ipswich Town are on an upward curve back to the Premier League. Um, I look after myself in my own managerial career and when an opportunity comes along, this is why things like, oh, I wonder if you ever be a switch money. If the stars never align that I'm out of work and the job's available and it fits, it's it never happens, does it? You know, everything has to line up really. A job has to come up, you have to be available. Um that's how it generally works. And so will the stars ever align for Ipswich? Will Ipswich be in the Premier League and I'll never be good enough? Or will Ipswich be in League One or League Two and, and you know, you have to come and try and be a save? Uh, who knows? Let's hope that Ipswich are on, as I said, an upward curve back to the Premier League and the current manager they've got is, uh, does an amazing job. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time. I looked at the other questions and most of them we've kind of answered. So, yeah, thank you for your time uh, uh, with the interview, but also the, the nine years that you gave us Ipswich, you, you know, very respected player and... Um, you were part of the team that finally got us back into the Premier League. So thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Listen, I've enjoyed it. Thank you. It's, it's great to see Kieran again and looking so well. And um, hopefully you've got a managerial or coaching career ahead of him. And he knows that I'm always there to, 
for any advice he might want. He, he might not want it, but that's okay. Any dilemmas, because there's lots of dilemmas and how to handle players and how to handle up. Managing up, I've probably found, is is the most challenging thing. You know, people who are in charge of you and yet haven't got the football knowledge and yet think they have got the football knowledge, it, it can be really, really challenging to, to manage up. And um, if ever I can help, you know, Kieran Dyer being, being a case, just for a conversation or a chat of what I would think would happen now, I'm more than happy to do things like that for people. You've helped me so much. Uh, not many people know that I went to Blackburn for a week. He let me come in. He gave me all ex uh, exclusive, you could say, recruitment meetings. I was in there, staff meetings. I was in there and, and I don't say this lightly, you were very, you're one of the closest people I've seen to Sir Bobby where you empower your staff. It was incredible. I'm in a recruitment room and it's not just his decision on signing players. You're asking his chief scout, should we go for him? Fino, what do you think? And I was just like, whoa, yeah. their decisions yeah. could make you lose your job. And then we'd go into staff and he'd just let the, the, the coaches get on with the, the, the coaching and, it was just fantastic to see and way football clubs are going now. Like you look at Ipswich Town, you've got a CEO, he brings his performance team in, he's got this, he's got that, and he just wants a coach and a manager to manage the team. Mm -hmm. This gaffer here was doing that years ago because he empowered all his staff to just let them get on with their roles. Obviously, he oversaw everything, but... Just given that empowerment to your staff, you don't know how valuable that is for their, for them. And that was one of the yeah. big takeaways I took from that. And I'll never forget that. Good one. Yeah. I think people have to grow in their jobs, and That's all. I think you have to feel you can get better every day. Otherwise, what's the point? Nobody wants to be standing still in life. I, I don't. I, you know, part of the reason if, if we talk about Blackburn Rovers, I, I did, I just, I didn't want to be stuck in the middle of the championship for year after year after year. They, I needed some investment. We were selling players. They should be putting more money back in the team and making the team better. And, and um, you shouldn't want to stand still. So as, a, as an analyst, as, as a recruitment analyst, as, as whatever you're doing, you're, you're a sports scientist or the physio, you want to get better. You're constantly asking if you can go and improve yourself. And, uh, and that's what I try and do with my staff. And they generally give it back to you in their time and their efforts and their workload. And, um, and when you've got people working more than nine to five hours in football clubs, you've got a chance of, of being special and being good. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks for your time. Okay. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you, you very, very much. Dinner. Great to see you.